Greetings, friends of astrobiology. Welcome to a brand new episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists. My name is Sanjay Som, and this program is made possible by contributions from ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, the NASA Astrobiology Program, and the nonprofit Blue Marble Space. Today, we have the immense privilege of welcome to the show, Dr. Carl Pilcher. But before we start talking to him, it is time for our monthly background quiz. So, Mike, if you could pop up the background from last time. It was, of course, the stromatolites from Shark Bay, Australia, evidence of ancient life that has managed to eke out a living even into this modern day. And they are likely the source of uh, the oxygen that started accumulating on our planet about two and a half billion years ago. And the first person who got it right, big shout out to, jo to Jason Major, uh, who, who got it right. So congratulations to you. And, um, and the background this month is probably a tad easier. It is a moon in the outer solar system. I think you all know it, but if you know it, make sure you use hashtag AskAstrobio to tell your answer. And if any point during this uh, program you have a question for Dr. Pilcher, make sure you use hashtag AskAstrobio on Twitter or ask your questions directly on the Siganet.org chat. Carl, it is immensely wonderful to have you on the program. Welcome. Thank you, Sanjoy. It's great to be here with everybody. You know, when I... When I was coming to the studio this morning, I was going over the questions I was going to ask you about how your youth contributed to your choices uh, in your professional career and so on. But uh, as I came over, I decided to throw all that out of the window and just begin this program by just saying thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for the astrobiology as a discipline, all that you've done for astrobiology as a community. Many of us who are early careers or almost early careers Oh, you, the ability to, to do astrobiology as a profession. You were influential when we were students, and I know you were influential also for professional scientists who are actively involved in astrobiology um, as, a, as, a, as a research topic. So I can't speak on behalf of anyone, but I know from the incredible uh, session we had for you at the Astrobiology Science Conference that everybody would agree to so just thank you for the amazing contributions you've done to our discipline. Well, Sandra, I thank you and, and, and thanks to the community and, and particularly the, the early career community. This has been the most rewarding thing I think I have ever done in my career. Uh, when the opportunity to become director of the NAI uh, opened up, there was not a job on earth that I wanted more than that job. And the, I, I, I have to give a lot of credit to the principal investigators in the NAI, too, because as soon as I came into the job, uh, we were in a financial crisis. The astrobiology program had just got cut in, cut, uh, in half uh, in terms of its budget. And the principal investigators took a voluntary cut in their budgets that had already been agreed to and negotiated. And one of the conditions was that we support the early career community. And that, of course, was something that I could endorse wholeheartedly. And we went forward, but it was very, very much with the support of the principal investigators. And that support continued as long as I was NAI uh, director. And I'm sure that support, I know that support continues today. So it, is, it wasn't just me, it was really a team of people and we were all very, very supportive of uh, the early career community and look what it's produced. It's created things, things like SagaNet uh, <laughs> and all the things that you're doing today. So it's very, very gratifying to see. The community is definitely, I think, what makes astrobiology special. Some of, some of my best friends and best colleagues uh, stem from the community you all supported uh, when we were younger. So thank you. Um, Astrobiology is something you have seen grow from a tiny little seed into a full-fledged NASA program. And I was wondering if you could go through us, uh, with us, through this, these steps, because they, the events that also shaped your career, um, you've also done everything in astrobiology. You, you were a grad student working on, on outer planets. You were a professor at a university. You were held management positions at NASA. You, you've done it all. And, it's, and we would love to hear about how you have gone through all these steps and what events in, in the sciences over the, over the past several decades led to these choices. 
So perhaps we can start at the beginning. Like, how did you get involved with astrobiology, and what was it like back then when you were when when you when you had a fierce beard? I have to admit, which unfortunately <laughs> don't have anymore. I didn't shave today try to try to be as cool as you, but uh, but in any case, take us back through these decades. Well, uh, perhaps one place to start is how little I knew about biology before I got involved in astrobiology. I got interested in chemistry while I was in high school and went to a high school where you could actually major in chemistry. And so I took this was Brooklyn Technical High School in New York City. And so I took chemistry 15 hours a week for my last two years of high school. But something had to get sacrificed in order for that to happen. And one of the things that got sacrificed was biology. And as it turned out, I went to an urban high school, an, an urban college, uh, Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn, as it was then called. It's now part of NYU. And it turned out in this urban university, the biology labs were about a mile away from the main building. And one thing led to another, and I didn't take biology in college either. And then, of course, I get into a graduate program in chemistry. And uh, there wasn't uh, any requirement that I take biology. So I, I reached a rather uh, late stage in my career without ever having taken biology. But what happened was in graduate school, I made a transition to space science, and that turned out to be planetary astronomy. Uh, I didn't go to graduate school quite with that intent. I had applied to chemistry departments since, after all, I had gotten a bachelor's degree in chemistry. But just about the time I was applying to schools, I was uh, thinking that I'd really like to figure out how to go into space science and without any formal training in astronomy or planetary science to speak of. I decided that that really wasn't the best way to continue making field transitions. So I felt that going back to school was the right way to do it. And I had a great opportunity to go to Princeton, had a great education in international relations. And then wound up going to work for NASA, not that I expected to. Uh, I was thinking I might go to work for the State Department uh, or uh, perhaps a, uh, the Brookings Institution. But NASA made me an offer that I couldn't refuse, which was to be the science director in Sally Ride's Office of Exploration, the one that she set up uh, after the loss of Space Shuttle Challenger. And when I arrived in government, when I arrived at my NASA office on the first day, I had no idea what my job was. Um, and it took me about a year to figure it out. And what I realized after about a year is that all these meetings that were on my calendar and that I had to keep going to, that that was the actual work. Because while I had been a professor, meetings were the things that interfered with my work. My work was at the telescope, my work was writing papers, my work was in the laboratory, my work was with my graduate students, and the meetings were the things that interfered with getting stuff done. And it took me about a year to figure out that in government, the meetings actually are the work. And that in government, it is not so much about the government official getting things done, it's about the government official enabling other people to get things done. And that's what we do in government. And uh, so I just went from position to position at NASA for another row oh, 15 years or so. And then along came ALH 84001, August 1996, the meteorite from Mars that people suspected had evidence of life. And at this point, I have not taken a biology course. And I thought, these questions that these people are raising are just going to be too much fun, way too much fun, uh, not to be a part of. And so I decided it was time to learn biology. And fortunately, by that time, I knew wonderful people like Ken Nielsen and Mitch Sogan and Norm Pace, who were all microbiologists who had become involved in NASA's programs. And I had gotten to know them through my various positions at NASA. And they, in different ways, took me under their wings and helped me uh, figure out how to learn some biology, particularly some microbiology. And I discovered the courses up at uh, the Marine Biological Lab that Mitch Sogan had a lot to do with. And uh, between one thing and another, I managed to learn enough biology 
uh, to start having a place in the astrobiology program at headquarters. And then a few years later, the opportunity uh, to move out and be director of the Institute uh, in California came up. And that was, as I mentioned, my dream job. And, um, you know, it's it, it's the, the most wonderful move that I think I ever made in my career. How did NASA get interested in astrobiology enough to form a official uh, program? Well, NASA was interested in these questions from the very outset of NASA. The exobiology program dates back to NASA's earliest days. I think 1959 was the first grant in a program that was not then called astro uh, exobiology, but became known a few years later as exobiology. And so NASA <clears throat> was supporting this work. Carl Woese, for example, in the 70s and early 80s, <clears throat> could not get support uh, for his work readily, and NASA was one of his principal sources of support. And so much of what we understand today about the three domains of life was originally supported by NASA through the exobiology program. So NASA was always interested in these questions of life beyond Earth. But what happened in 1996 and subsequently was, I think, a real integration of the fields. Exobiology existed on its own, and the, the, it was interdisciplinary, but it was not as interdisciplinary as we realized we needed to be post ALH 84001. And so the... Uh, astrobiology program, I think the big difference between astrobiology and exobiology as a NASA program is that the astrobiology program was charged with proactively bringing together scientists from disciplines which would not generally be interacting. And to, to do so um, in a very proactive way, and to forge collaborations that would not otherwise have occurred. And that, of course, is what the NASA Astrobiology Institute has been all about. I get a lot of questions uh, through SaganNet and by email about uh, students asking me how to become an astrobiologist. And I always tell them there's, there's no single path because no single astrobiologist is the same as the other. Um, but what is your take on this? How do you feel astrobiology integrates in the modern scientific endeavor? Well, I think astrobiology provides an example of how science increasingly has to be done. That is, it has to be done across disciplinary boundaries. Now, a student who wants to uh, work in astrobiology is faced with that standard problem that you really have to have expertise in a particular discipline. Frequently, that's essential for getting a job. So if uh, you're going to, if you're seeking a job as a faculty member, uh, whatever department is going to hire you is going to want you to be able to teach the introductory courses in that department's discipline, whether that's geology or biology or chemistry or physics or astronomy. So you have to demonstrate some depth. But on the other hand, in order to be an astrobiologist, you really have to develop breadth as well. And this tension between depth and breadth is a tension that I think every scientist has to deal with in his or her career. And I think in astrobiology, you have to deal with it particularly, and you have to find your own path through that, really. I think in my career, I have really gone for breadth. And I recognize that in some ways, I have sacrificed depth. I would not call myself an expert in any particular of the component fields of astrobiology, but I do think that my skill is in uh, connecting the dots and putting all of the pieces together and knowing who are the experts who can provide the in-depth knowledge that's required. But everybody has to find their, their own way through that thicket, but you need the right balance of breadth and depth for you as a person and as a scientist and for your career goals. That's great advice. Thanks, Carl. How has your education in international affairs shaped the way you, you, you shaped who you are as a scientist, but also as a leader of scientists? 
You know, I almost can't answer that question because it so profoundly changed the way I think that it's very hard for me to go back to before that experience and remember what I was like and, and how I might have functioned later on had I not had that experience. So it's a hard question for me to answer. Okay. But being, being immersed in social science for three years, I was at Princeton for three years, two to get the degree, and then I, I had support as a visiting fellow for a year. And being immersed in social science for three years was such a different experience from my life in the physical sciences that it, it, um, it, it, it really just completely changed the way I thought. I, I thought things were very reductionist. We had gone to the moon because Kennedy was a visionary and that was a great thing to do for science and for technology. And lo and behold, it was all part of the uh, Cold War and our competition with the Soviet Union. And I don't think I knew that before I went off and uh, got into a social science world. Now, I think many people who were scientists did understand that at the time, but I know that I didn't until I arrived uh, on the East Coast in, in Princeton and then particularly spent a summer working at the United Nations and suddenly realized that international relations and politics had been drivers of so many things that I thought, oh, this is all just rational stuff and you know, decisions being made on the scientific merits or the technical merits. And lo and behold, uh, there were all kinds of economic, historical, and political considerations that had gone on. And uh, another part of my education in social science was organizational dynamics and how organizations function and why decisions get made by organizations, be it a corporation or a government. And so that experience just really profoundly changed the way I thought. It turned out to be my uh, entry card into government. The person who hired me uh, told me that he hired me because I had this combination of this policy credential combined with my scientific uh, background and experience. And I don't think I could have functioned in government the way I did without the perspective that I gained um, at Princeton during those three years of being with social scientists. So can astrobiology influence social science as well? You mentioned some very interesting uh, uh, things when you're discussing what motivated you to join international affairs was the desire to understand the world. But humanity tends to have a very short historical memory and some of the mistakes that happened in the past hopefully are not, but seem to be happening again today. Um, does astrobiology have a, have a way to contribute to the conversation of, of, of in the social sciences? Well, you know, I think I think of SegaNet as a way that astrobiology is contributing to society and implicitly, if not explicitly, uh, to the social sciences using science as uh, SegaNet does and as so many of us do in astrobiology, using science as a means to reach out to the public and get the, <clears throat> the public engaged in a dialogue about societal problems. I just gave a lecture a couple of days ago on astrobiology and climate change. And that's just one example where an astrobiological perspective can be brought to bear. And uh, people can begin to see the climate change that is occurring on Earth today in a historical light of four billion years of climate change and see what we are doing to the planet today and how we are returning it to a state that it hasn't been in in uh, at least a couple of million years and uh, looking back at earlier um, examples like the uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum for example as a metaphor uh, and a uh, an analog to what we're doing uh, today so I think astrobiology has a lot to contribute and the nice thing of course is that it is attractive to people and so people want to hear about it. And as we share astrobiology with people, we can get them engaged in discussions of larger issues. 
I've definitely had a great deal of success personally using astrobiology to communicate science to especially the, uh, the young kids at the elementary school level because they don't realize they're talking about science, <laughs> but you can grab them with the, with the thoughts of aliens and what does it take for life to be uh, beyond Earth. Um, so there's this, uh, I don't know if the word frustration is the right one, but so space exploration and astrobiology are long-term goals that are sometimes multi-generational, particularly when talking about humanity on Mars and elsewhere, which is part of astrobiology. But uh, the way the, the, the agency is led is from a political standpoint, the goals tend to be reset every administration. Um, you've been in government, that, has, that must have been quite frustrating. How does one navigate that to try and keep the ship steered in, in one direction and not like vacillate? Well, I think NASA has had a, a steady course in many ways. You look at the robotic science program, the, the program that's been run by the science office. And the program that's been run by the science office has not been subject that much to the every four year changes. Uh, our missions uh, that, that have run by that office take uh, more than four years generally to develop. And they've had bipartisan support in Congress. Congress tends to be generally uh, supportive of NASA science. The human spaceflight program in contrast, has gone through a lot of back and forth, but even there, the human spaceflight program has had long-term projects, the space station and the shuttle being the uh, two most obvious ones. And those projects, once they get support, uh, have been uh, brought to completion. So there is uncertainty, but for the most part, I think NASA has actually uh, run a, a pretty steady course, particularly in the science area. That's good to hear. And so where do you see the science going in the future? What are the discoveries you would love to see in, in the coming decade in astrobiology? Well, you know, of course, there's the holy grail of N equals two, uh, <laughs> as everybody, you know, participating in this particular broadcast right now knows, I'm sure we only have one example of life on Earth. And therefore, we don't know what is necessary for life and what is contingent, what just happened to work out that for this way uh, for life on Earth. So certainly finding a second example of life uh, is, is certainly the holy grail of astrobiology. Uh, and if, uh, you know, if, 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 if I had my choice of discoveries, that would that would be the discovery that for me would be just most astonishing. Uh, but even finding um, life elsewhere in this solar system, even if it didn't have a separate origin from life on Earth, even if it was microbes on Mars that are producing methane and and uh, discharging it into the atmosphere today, and even if those microbes had a common origin with uh, life on Earth, we would uh, still learn a tremendous amount about evolution because presumably those two uh, enclaves of life would have been separated for billions of years. And we would get to see uh, what happens at least at the microbial level if uh, we took the same initial conditions and then let things run in a completely different way. So, uh, Certainly uh, another discovery that would be very exciting would be to find very strange things going on on an extrasolar planet and to begin to have some suspicion that there might be some kind of non-physical, potentially biological process going on on an extrasolar planet because it just had a weird atmosphere. Of course, we know that you can get weird atmospheres uh, by physical and chemical processes too. So that would be uh, both an interesting discovery, but also an interesting challenge to people to try to figure out what are the very many ways that uh, strange things can happen in the universe. So from your experience as a social scientist and working in government, what do you think would be the implications, not on the science side, if n equals two or when n equals two? Well, you know, we, we've already kind of seen this a little bit. So 
So, for example, let's go back to 1996. So there's a press conference that doesn't say we found N equals 2. It just says that we have found evidence of life on Mars in a meteorite that came from Mars. Well, what happened is it led to a billion dollar per year increase in NASA's budget. And there's a dirty little secret that I will reveal uh, that is it could have been a $2 billion a year increase in NASA's budget. But NASA just didn't want to have that much of an increase at, at that time in one particular area. So um, the political system responded in a tremendously positive way to this amazing discovery. And I think that that is is the way I think the political system is most likely to respond to uh, really substantive new information that isn't uh, so much a, a, a subject of uh, political concern. The, the kinds of information that's a subject of political concern is information that some people fear would cause government to take greater control of their lives. And that's why climate change is such a problem uh, for so many people. They, I believe that they feel that they have to deny the science because if they acknowledge the science, then they are, are then led to acknowledge uh, that governments are the only entities large enough to have an impact on these areas and therefore, government has to play a larger role. And if you believe deep down in your soul that uh, government should not be controlling your life, then you have to back up and say that, well, that science must not be right, because if it's right, it just leads in a direction that I just can't, can't handle. Uh, I don't think things about life in the universe are going to do that so much. Of course, there is always the question about uh, religion and fundamentalism, but the uh, many of the religions, certainly in the United States and I think around the world, are very accepting of the potential for there to be life beyond Earth. Just for example, um, if you believe that God has all power, then God has the power to create life elsewhere, just as uh, God created life on Earth, if that happens to be your, uh, your religious belief. So I, I don't think that the reaction would be problematic and negative, except perhaps in, in certain areas. I think in general, government would respond in a very positive way, as it already has. Yeah, I think that's true. It would, it would force us to think about what does it mean to be humans, and hopefully N equals 2 will make us realize that we are humans first, and then American, Chinese, Muslims, or Christians. Mm -hmm. But uh, so oh, I'm, I'm hopeful for, for a positive effect, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Carl, I could talk with you forever about these topics, but we have an, an audience, an international audience. Mm -hmm. So my last question for you before I'm moving to, the, to, our, to, our, uh, to our audience is, is so Astrobody is growing not only in the United States, but all over the world. What would be kind of your vision of this international groups sprouting everywhere and starting slowly to work together? Oh, well, this is, of course, one of the things that I uh, pursued very strongly as director of the NAI. The astrobiology expertise is, of course, distributed all around the world, and there's tremendous interest in astrobiology all around the world. My vision has always been of an integrated international community pursuing astrobiology, working together, working not only across disciplinary boundaries, boundaries uh, but across the boundaries between international organizations and between governments. And I think we have realized this to some degree, but there's a lot more that can be done. The International Partner Program uh, of the NAI, I think, has been a real contributor to this. But there's, uh, there, there are many more synergies that can be realized. And I think that's one of the uh, uh, challenges and the opportunities, uh, for example, for the new NAI director for Penny Boston. 
<laughs> Indeed, we're excited about you, Penny. <laughs> um, all right, so Carl, thanks again. Um, I'm going to move the, the the questions to the audience. So again, if you're uh, listening and watching this this uh, series live, you can use hashtag Ask Astrobio on Twitter, or you can ask questions directly on the Segnet.org main chat room. So uh, let's begin. So uh, Landon Stever. Uh, thank you for your question. Asks Dr. Pilcher, how do degrees in chemistry translate to astrobiology? Well, um, well, Landon, when I uh, decided that I needed to start learning biology, and and this was in the mid to late 1990s, the one of the first things I did was I picked up a biology textbook, and in fact, I picked up a molecular cell biology textbook. I had actually seen one on the coffee table of Mike Carr, who was a planetary scientist at the USGS uh, in Menlo Park at the time. And I was visiting his home and I saw this big, thick, two inch thick uh, cell biology textbook on his coffee table. And he said, yeah, he was reading it and trying to learn some biology. And I picked it up and I flipped through it and I realized this was just bizarrely complex chemistry that uh, the chemical principles that were in that book were principles I understood. It was just that they were being applied to bizarrely complex molecules. But I thought, I can read this and I can understand this. So I started reading that and then, uh, then found other courses and got uh, a lot of help from, from great uh, uh, biologists, uh, microbiologists in particular. Uh, and so that was really how chemistry uh, was for me a uh, an opening into biology. Wonderful. Sebastian asks, Dr. Pilcher, I'm starting a PhD in microbiology next fall. What steps should I make to make an impact in astrobiology? Well, think broadly. Uh, think about microbiology, uh, which, of course, can and, and will get very, very specialized. You'll be looking at, at you know, particular phenomena or particular organisms. But think about it in the context. Think about it in the broader context of the evolution of microbes, uh, the, the four and a half billion year history or four billion year history of life on Earth. Uh, and in the context of the potential for microbial habitats elsewhere, uh, the context of extremophiles here on Earth. So uh, while you are getting very, very specific in your studies, uh, make sure that you, you maintain a broad view of the context that your work fits into. Thanks, Sebastian. So Andrew Planet is next. He's asking a question about the, uh, the the solvent for life. Whether you think water is the is uniquely uh, the solvent for biology, and uh, the conversation continues on Twitter. Who is who is uh, asking? And Ben Pierce continues to ask about what do you think the instruments should be on the Europa subsurface ocean submarine. Well, let me let's uh, let's go do water first. <laughs> Uh, water is certainly a great solvent for life, uh, and if water is your solvent, then uh, carbon chain molecules are the only molecules uh, that really form very uh, long complex molecules in water. So if you believe that, uh, that water is a solvent, then, then you have a, a carbon water chemistry, although of course it doesn't have to be the carbon water chemistry we have on Earth. Water, of course, is also made from the first and third most abundant elements in the universe. And so the universe really is a case of water, water everywhere. And that's why follow the water and looking for water is really a pretty good starting place. But it's not the only possibility. Uh, people ask whether there could be uh, life, for example, in the methane, ethane seas of Titan uh, and, and lakes. Uh, you know, that's kind of fanciful. Uh, one of the issues is, does a solvent for life have to be polar or not? Water, of course, is polar. Methane isn't. Uh, so there's that issue. Uh, but uh, one can be fanciful and uh, think about uh, liquid nitrogen. We have liquid nitrogen in the outer solar system. It's probably powering the geysers on Triton, the moon of Neptune. 
And it turns out that silicon chain molecules are stable in liquid nitrogen. They're not stable in water. Might you have a silicon-based life on Triton with silicon chain molecules in a liquid nitrogen solvent? Of course, reaction rates would be rather slow at those kinds of temperatures. Uh, but there are certainly uh, things that one can, can imagine in, uh, in terms of alternative solvents. So I think we have to keep our minds open about all of that. Instruments in, in a Europa subsurface ocean explorer, well, I am reminded of Carl Sagan's argument about putting a camera on the Viking lander. Because in the early days of the space program, cameras were not thought of as scientific instruments. The early days of the space program were uh, largely involved in studying particles and fields, and the, the very uh, first missions uh, were missions to study Earth's um, Van Allen belts, named after Jim Van Allen, who was a leader of, uh, of that uh, era of the space program. And cameras were, were really not seen as scientific instruments, and there were initially not plans to include a camera on the Viking landers. And Carl's argument, as I have heard it described to me, was, look, if a giraffe walks by the lander, I want to know about it. <laughs> and and uh, Carl's arguments for putting cameras on the landers succeeded. Uh, so I have to say, the very first thing I'd want to see on something going down into the Europa Ocean was a camera. If something swims by, I want to know about it. And beyond that, of course, you want, you want to know about the chemistry. You want to know, are there, um, is there a redox gradient in that ocean? Are there both reduced species and oxidized species? And if there are, then you've got something that can power metabolism. Giraffes on Europa. That's something I'll take home today following this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Swimming giraffes, no doubt. Swimming giraffes. <laughs> no less. Kitty Shady asks, what is it in astrobiology that keeps you motivated and passionate all those years and until now? Great questions, Kitty. Oh, astrobiology just asks the, the most exciting questions and requires you to bring together so many areas of knowledge. I think the thing that really motivates me is seeing the connections between various areas of biology and chemistry and astronomy and planetary science and history and philosophy and just making those connections for me is is just glorious and I, I, I love doing that and I continue to do it um, just seeing the connections between things and then working with other people who are similarly motivated by these profound questions we ask and by the connections between everything else. So I, I think this community is such a wonderful community because astrobiology attracts in people who really are turned on by the uh, depth of the questions that we ask, uh, their depth and breadth, and by the excitement of making these connections between different fields. So uh, I, it's, I, I think it's just glorious. It what's, it's what motivates me, and I will probably continue to be motivated by it uh, as long as I'm on this earth. It's also almost at the intersection with philosophy, too, because the, the, the questions are so big that they very much lie into the realm of philosophy and makes for very interesting conversations at conferences. <laughs> very much so. J Jacob Hackmestra asks, when discussing science with government officials, how can we as scientists best communicate the value of our work? Seems a very pertinent in today's world. Yeah, well, it depends upon which science officials you're talking to. If you're talking to your program manager at NASA or the NSF, uh, you would approach that conversation, I think, in a different way than if you uh, got a, uh, an opportunity to speak with a person in government who is not a scientist. So uh, for, for people in government who are not scientists, you have to be able to communicate the importance of what you do, the significance of what you do. And that's where I come back to understanding the context of your work. 
you have to be able to put your work into a broader context of society or a broader context of science and be able to describe how the knowledge that you are gaining, which may be in a very narrow specialized area, the uh, how that knowledge fits together into a larger picture of our understanding uh, our place in the universe or our understanding how some aspect of the earth works, etc. So I think you have to take a different approach depending upon who you're talking to, what their background is, and what their motivations are. Um, you have to remember to try to put yourself in their shoes and have an idea of what their job is and what they're trying to accomplish. And basically think about how can you help them accomplish their job? Because if you help them accomplish their job, they will really appreciate what you have done and they'll remember you. Empathy, yeah, what a concept. <laughs> Marco Antonio de Ulho at Sintra, I hope I pronounced that properly, asks, is there hope that in the short or medium term, we will know the path of prebiotic chemistry, which has led to the emergence of life? Wow. Um, <laughs> well, the, the exciting thing is that people are trying to close in on this from both directions. That is, there is the bottom-up approach and the top-down approach. And the bottom-up approach, of course, starts with chemistry and, and looks at how chemistry uh, can build up to more and more complex molecules. The top-down approach looks at what we know about life uh, on Earth today and how can we uh, pick the processes of life apart to try to understand their, uh, their chemical origins. And there are groups uh, coming together. I just happened to read a press release that was put out by Georgia Tech, which has folks working uh, in both directions, uh, from the top down and from the bottom up. But there are many other groups uh, as well doing one or both of those. And so we, we, I think we are closing in, but it's a uh, tremendously difficult problem because the simplest cell is vastly, vastly more complex than the most complex chemical network that we've created in the laboratory in studying prebiotic chemistry. So there still is a big gap between those. How long it will take uh, for that gap to be bridged, I certainly couldn't say, but it is very encouraging that people are working together and they're working in both directions and they're trying to find places to meet in the middle. Indeed. Adam Smith asks, what's the most attractive astrobiology target in the solar system? Wow, I don't know. As any NAI director, I try to avoid taking sides on that. Uh, I have to uh, acknowledge a certain affection that I have for Europa because Europa helped me get my PhD, and I've always been grateful to it for, uh, for that reason. Um, one of my, my papers published as a graduate student was uh, the uh, discovery of uh, water frost on Europa uh, done astronomically. So I've always uh, had, had particular fondness for Europa, but certainly Enceladus and Titan are both very, very exciting bodies. Enceladus is delivering samples of its ocean to space so we don't even have to uh, melt our way through the ice. And Titan, of course, we can land on a lake in principle. And frankly, I'm really interested in Triton. I would love to know what's going on in those pools of liquid nitrogen. Now, it's probably only chemistry. But, uh, but there are geysers, there are nit nitrogen geysers on Triton, and they're uh, spewing out dark particles. I would love to know what's in those dark particles. So uh, I think there are a lot of very interesting candidates, although uh, deep in my heart, I, I, I think uh, my affection for Europa is, uh, is, is something that's very long-lasting. So you discovered water frosts on Europa as a grad student. So thanks for making us all look average in our graduate degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Croft asks, do you see the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, so SETI, being included once again in the NASA astrobiology program going forward? You know, I don't know whether it will be included formally in the program, which really means uh, that the NASA money will be going toward that. 
but I think it's certainly intellectually part of the astrobiology program. Uh, certainly, uh, what we want to understand is about the potential for life beyond Earth. And the potential for life beyond Earth certainly includes the potential for intelligent life and the potential for civilizations and for technology. So I think intellectually, uh, SETI is absolutely a part of astrobiology. Whether it is formally a part of NASA's astrobiology program is more of a question of uh, economics and bureaucracy and, and politics and priorities. And uh, I can't really say where that's going to go. But certainly intellectually, I, I don't see how you can separate it. Indeed. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, so Shane Carberry Mogan is going to get the last question. Do you think life is just a process of chemistry or is there more to the phenomenon? Well, um, <laughs> I, I think the, the, the very interesting possibility is that life is a naturally self-organizing uh, characteristic of matter. So um, if, if life is, is basically a planetary process, one, one of the processes that happens on a planet under the right conditions, then life is not just chemistry and physics, but life is an emergent phenomenon that emerges from the laws of chemistry and physics, but emerges as something that I think we can think of as, as distinct. You know, one of the questions is, are there laws of biology that are comparable to the laws of physics and chemistry? And there may be. There may be laws that govern this emergence uh, that we call life. And people are trying to investigate that and to try to determine if there are underlying laws of biology. Uh, one of the arguments about why we find it so difficult to define life is that we don't have the underlying principles yet, and we don't know what the underlying laws of biology are. And so as, as uh, Carol Cleland and Chris Chiba have said, it's like trying to define water in the 16th century without knowing anything about atoms and molecules. You really can't do it terribly well. So uh, I, I think of life as an emergent phenomenon that might emerge anytime the conditions are suitable because it is a planetary process. As um, some folks have said, uh, David Grinspoon and, and others, uh, Eric Smith and, and Harold Morowitz, uh, life may be something that happens to a planet, not something that happens on a planet. Those are some incredible words to, to slowly close this program. But before we do so, those of you who are uh, watching on the live program, please enter the country where you're connecting from in the different chat rooms, whether on Twitter or on the stake in the chat. It'll be cool to see the, the breadth of the audience we have. Uh, Carl, it's been an absolute pleasure to share this hour with you. Uh, thank you very much for all those words of wisdom. Uh, perhaps you have some, some, some parting statements you would like to make? Well, I just want to once again uh, thank you, Sanjoy, and uh, and Jacob, and the others who founded SegaNet and who founded Blue Marble Space. You are really a product of the astrobiology program, and you are the future of the astrobiology program. So I just want to say that I think that the, the fact that uh, the early career astrobiologists have come together uh, in this magnificent way is for me personally gratifying, but uh, as well really points to a really bright future for astrobiology. So I just want to thank you, Sanjoy, personally, and thank all of your early career and now mid-career colleagues uh, for doing all that you're doing to, to advance uh, the field and ensure a, a really brilliant future for it. 
Well, thank you, Carl. And Seganet was indeed born in 2011 during the Astrobiology Graduate Student Conference, which is a conference that the NASA Astrobiology trusts early career uh, students to put together and run. So uh, this is a product of this. So uh, with, with that, Carl, have a wonderful evening and day in, in California. All the best, and we hope to talk to you soon. Watchers, uh, please make sure you keep an eye on SegaNet.org for the announcement of the next, next Ask an Astrobiologist. And until then, stay curious. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.